In 1985, for the first time, we accept new students lintas jalur under the name of Public Health Study Programs or PSKM, Faculty of Medicine, Diponegoro University. Since 1987, PSKM began admitting new students for jalur regular for the first time. In 1993, PSKM changed to the Faculty of Public Health based on the decree of the Minister of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia. Faculty of Public Health Vision In the year of 2024, Faculty of Public Health becomes an excellent higher education institution in the field of public health at the international level. Faculty of Public Health has the following objectives to produce graduates who have the spirit of Pancasila, competent and have social awareness, complete communicator, professional, leader, entrepreneur, thinker, educator, and miracle, manager, innovator, researcher, apprentice, communitarian, leader, and educator. To produce innovative research, publications in reputable national and international journals, attainment in intellectual property rights, Contribution in solving public health problems To organize transparent and accountable public health higher education Organizing cooperation and partnership in the field of key pillar of higher education Organizational structure in faculty of public health is leader, namely Dean, Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, Vice Dean for Resource, Division of Administration, namely Manager or Head of Administration, Supervisor. or Head of Subdivision of Academic and Student Affairs, Supervisor or Head of Subdivision of Finance and Employee Affairs, Supervisor or Head of Subdivision of General and Asset Management. Faculty of Public Health Managing Study Programs, Public Health Undergraduate Study Program Superior Accreditation, Master of Public Health Study Program Superior Accreditation Master of Environmental Health Study Program Superior Accreditation Master of Health Promotion Study Program Superior Accreditation and Doctor of Public Health Study Program Very Good Accreditation The implementation of the education program in Faculty of Public Health is supported by domestic and overseas graduate lecturers. Currently, the faculty has 33 lecturers with doctoral degree, 50% of 66 lecturers with various scientific fields. They are Health Administration and Policy, Public Health Nutrition, Epidemiology and Tropical Disease, Occupational Safety and Health, Environmental Health, Biostatistics and Population, and Health Promotion. In the learning process, Faculty of Public Health supported by education staff as much as from various background, competencies, and professionalism. Infrastructure, Building and Laboratories, Building A, the Dune Building to Floor 
building B, lecture rooms, three floors. Building C, lecture rooms, two floors. Meeting room. At the building D, secretariat room, lecture room for graduate programs, computer laboratories, public health laboratories, unit room of faculty support, and hall. Building E, student activities room. Building F, student activity center, praying room, and canteen. Building G, lecture room and secretariat room of undergraduate study programs, library, archive room, and study activities room. Other facilities... Good afternoon, Prof. Usman. How are you? Basketball field, volleyball field, and other sport facilities. Good afternoon, Dr. Good afternoon, Dr. Okay. Property of public health yeah. health. yeah, waiting a little bit. Some laboratory of now is meeting in the waiting room. So we will let them in first. Laboratory of environmental health. Okay. Laboratory of occupational okay. safety health. Okay, thank you. Laboratory of epidemiology and entomology. Laboratory of public health nutrition. And laboratory of audiovisual aid. Faculty of public health has international programs since 2016 in order to support the Ponegoro University to be the world-class university. The programs are International Conference of Public Health, Tropical and Coastal Development and summer course followed by students from many countries. Student Selamat siang, Pak Budiono. Pak Dekan, Oh ya, yes, Pak. Yes, nah, kita Selamat ini Dr. Osman sudah masuk. Ya, sebentar lagi kita akan mulai ini. Sudah pesertanya alhamdulillah sudah masuk 52. Superior programs are Study Center of Environment and Toxic Material, Study Center of Neglected Hello, Tropical Study Center of Reproductive Health and HIV AIDS. Uh, Dr. Osman, I would like to introduce. Public health this is my dean, Dr. Yono. Please say hello. Mas Riyadi, you can stop the video. Uh, Prof. Osman, how are you? How are you? Hello, fine. And uh, how are you? Uh, fine. Okay. This, this is my dean, Dr. Budiono. Yes. Hello. And now in another side, they have the Ibu Chris Wardani. She yeah. is the mm. head of Master Program of Public Health. Uh, Ibu Chris, Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon. Waalaikumsalam. You may show up. <laughs> How is in Taiwan, Prof. Usman? How is the COVID situation? <laughs> So far, Alhamdulillah, is fine here. Uh, we were just um, got the suspect. Um, mm. Then need to do some home quarantine. Uh, you know, uh, and there are um, some precautions we have to take. Uh, ah, I see. Uh, Bukhesh Parani, this is Dr. Osman. You may say hello to Dr. Osman. Dr. Osman, uh, Bukhesh Parani. Uh, Dr. Chris Wardani is the head of Master Program of Public Health. Uh, right. She will invite you. <laughs> and also Pak Budiono, Dr. Budiono, he is yeah. the head of uh, the faculty. Okay, uh, we are very delighted to invite you. We want to know the another perspective from another country. Yeah. Okay. There will be around 60 or 70 participants who will join this afternoon. That's great. Okay. Pak Budiono, can we start now? Or we wait a little bit? Okay, that's okay. Yeah. I'm ready. Okay, it is better we start now. 
Okay, all participants. Uh, Dr. Usman, I will speak in Bahasa and also in English. <laughs> okay, selamat siang para hadirin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Pada siang ini kita akan melakukan kegiatan yang kita beri nama visiting professor, yang mana pada siang ini kita mengundang Dr. Usman, Dr. Usman Iqbal. He is from dia dari Taipei Medical University, yang mana beliau adalah ahli di bidang teknologi informasi. Jadi, visiting profesor siang hari ini merupakan kegiatan rutin yang diadakan oleh Magister Kesehatan Masyarakat dan juga tentunya FKM dalam rangka untuk memperkaya wawasan mahasiswa di FKM Undip. So, in this afternoon, Uh, this visiting professors is a routine activity who held by master program of public health and also for from the faculty of public health. As we know nowadays, the big data is the currently many people speak about the big data. It has become intensively studied in a recent years. With development of the internet, The mobile internet and also the internet, the social media, biology, finance, and digital medicine, the volume of data become increased dramatically. So the big data is only described the last size of the data, but it is also implied in rapid data processing ability and also the novel technology and approaches for handling the big data. I would like to welcome Our Dean, Dr. Budiono, good afternoon. Selamat siang, good afternoon. Yeah. Pak Budiono. And also our Head of Program Study of Public Health. Please welcome to Dr. Chris Wardani. Selamat siang, Bu Chris Wardani. Selamat siang, thank you very much. And also, I would like to welcome our guest lecturer, Dr. Usman Iqbal. Good afternoon. Dr. Usman Iqbal. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. For the first time, we would like to Dr. Budiono to give the welcoming speech. Time and screen is yours. Please, Dr. Budiono. Thank you, Mr. Farid Agusibana, PhD. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Dear Vice Dean for the Academic and Student Affairs, Dr. Rosa Suli, Vice Dean for the Resource, Dr. Apoina Kartini, lecturers, students, and also participants. I respect to speaker, Prof. Dr. Usman Iqbal from Taipei Medical University. Actually, our Uh, undergraduate uh, program, uh, I mean my alumni also continue study in this uh, in your uh, university, Taipei Medical University. The name is Ramdan. Uh, welcome, Dr. Osman, uh, for this meeting. Thank Are you, you okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, for all participants in the virtual meeting, also welcome to this meeting. First of all, let us uh, praise to Allah Subhanahu wa ta Taala, who give us uh, a favor to uh, attend this day. And this webinar was initiated by Dr. Chris Wardani as a head of study program of master program of public uh, health, and also for a Agus Sibana PSD as a secretary of uh, study program of uh, public health and of course and the, and the team. Uh, this program involves students of uh, the faculty of public health, the Ponegoro University, especially in the magister of public health and the lecturers. Uh, You know that the uh, Diponegoro University has a program called Visiting Professor. 
guest lecture from the world class university achievement. Uh, this program uh, is conducted routinely, like uh, Mr. Farid said uh, before, and will continue, I think, the next uh, year, to the next year. Uh, we know that's the data. Uh, this, uh, we know that uh, this meeting is, uh, I think, very, very good for elevated our knowledge in the big data, of course and its implementation of the big data, uh, especially in the health uh, big data. And also we hope for the potential uh, networking uh, and collaboration between us. We realize uh, that the maturity of data, uh, especially in our country, uh, in health sector, such in printed form. And but now uh, we realize uh, that Digitalization is uh, moving forward. Now, big data is a crucial issue, including the big data for decision in the health sector. The use of big data can contribute the cost efficiency, uh, like uh, McKinsey uh, research. Uh, they projected that the using big data in the health sector can reduce the management, uh, data management cost by more or less uh, 300 billion dollars. So this is an, I'm, I think I'm to enrich it, the knowledge and experience of the student and also lecturers and the participant in the field of uh, big data, especially health Big data management. Today we are going to discuss the big data and in the health sector for decision making. Hopefully, uh, Prof. Osman Iqbal, uh, the lecturers, students, and the participants enjoying this seminar. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Thank you, Dr. Budiono. Welcome. Now, before we start the this visiting professor, I would like to introduce uh, our and only 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 one the speaker in this afternoon is only one, and I will give. I will introduce Dr. Usman Iqbal. For the education, Dr. Usman Iqbal is graduated from Institute of Biomedical Informatics College of Medical Science and Technology, Taipei. He is a doctor of philosophy, doctor of philosophy on health informatics or biomedical informatics. Before, he is also graduated from Federal Urdu University of Art, Science and Technology at the Faculty of Pharmacy, Karachi, Pakistan, in Pakistan. He is Doctor of Pharmacy. So, Dr. Usman uh, has two doctoral degrees. And also, he is graduated from Taipei Medical University at the School of Healthcare Administration College of Management, Taipei, at Taiwan Master in Business Administration, Healthcare Administration. And nowadays, Dr. Osman is Assistant Professor at the Master Program in Global Health and Development Department, and also in the PSC Program in Global Health and Health Security at the College of Public Health, Taipei Medical University. And Dr. Osman is also a digital health consultant and principal investigator at the International Center for Health Information and Technology. So I believe that Dr. Osman is very busy because many, many lecturers that he has to handle. But he is also the scientific committee member at or the reviewer at the SAM journal, international journal, and also one of them is the computer method and program in 
biomedicine update at Elsevier. It is very famous journal. Okay, this afternoon, uh, I would like to thank to all the students who are participate and also some, I look at here, also some participant from the undergraduate degree, master degree, and also some lecturer who come to this afternoon. Okay, for now, I would like to give time to Dr. Usman for giving lecture. And also after that, we can discuss many things about the big data and also about the policy, how the big data support the health policy. Thank you very much, Dr. Budiono, Dr. Wardani. Thank you. And then now yeah, I, give, I give the time for Dr. Oman. Usman. Please, you can share with us. Thank you. Uh, I would like to share my slides. Can you see my slides? Okay, that is good already. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fried, for the um, introduction and uh, the invitation, kind invitation to give a talk and uh, Professor, Dr. Budi um, Yono, and um, it's my really pleasure to give a talk today. And uh, assalamu alaikum to everyone. Oh, uh, um, big data issue and support for decision um, making process for policy, which is very important. As uh, Professor Budi Yono just uh, explained, that how the big data is, uh, you know, getting more and more importance day by day. And uh, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> again, thank you for inviting. And I really like this poster. And so <laughs> it's really so nice, so cool. I so, already posted in the link at Oh, thank you. So yeah. Much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's really nice. Um, thank you again. So as uh, Dr. Farid has already mentioned that I'm currently working as an assistant professor at uh, Taipei Medical University in Global Health Department. Uh, we have two programs, master's and PhD program. And we do have scholarships for both programs. And uh, all the students are encouraged to apply for this program. And I had before uh, students from Indonesia and they successfully graduated. Um, from the master's program in global health as well. And uh, I think it's really good um, department which provide opportunity if somebody uh, would like to pursue a degree in um, you know, global health. And they can also see that how the global health informatics or the technology can play an important role in the public health. And then I'm also, um, affiliated with the International Center for Health Information Technology. Um, so where we have digital health projects um, and I'm also PI for some of the projects. And I also involved with Australia for last couple of years, almost eight years. So I'm full fellow of Australian College of Health Informatics, which is nowadays called Australian Institute of Digital Health and also Australian uh, College of Health Services and Management. So Australia also have taken a lot of initiatives in digital health just recently. Um, so they were, that's why you see that they have the new college institute called Digital Health, and they are taking more um, national initiatives on digital health too. Um, besides the journal things, um, I have been involved in several journals for uh, almost um, you know eight to ten years as well. So I was. Uh, Managing editor for International Journal for Quality in Healthcare, which was from the Oxford University Press, and it was also official journal of uh, ISQA. ISQA is the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, which usually accredited the surveyors uh, for the the who do the accreditation in hospitals. And 
uh, another journal I was managing uh, as associate editor as well. I'm still associate editor is called Computer Method and Program in Biomedicine, uh, which is from here. And it has 3.4 impact factor. And then recently I am running uh, one journal as associate editor is called BMJ Healthcare and Informatics. And uh, I also joined as editor in chief computer method and program in biomedicine update journal. This is a new journal, but it's the sister journal of the main computer method and program in biomedicine uh, journal, which has 3.4 impact factor. So um, the one of the, um, the point I would like to mention here is that you all are welcome to submit the uh, papers which are within the scope uh, to this journal and we can um, expedite the process for fast review uh, in this journal. This is also the one of the slogan. This journal is fully open access, uh, but we don't have any fees until September, 2021. So you all are welcome to submit any papers relevant to this journal and we can try to expedite the uh, process for the publication. So since we are going to talk about big data, um, how it can help to change or impact on the policy uh, in healthcare. In Taiwan, um, because you know that Taiwan has a IT infrastructure which is well established nationally. And the reason one that why it was very well established is because they have a strong collaboration with academic and industry. So the academics, they work closely with the hospitals, uh, with other industry partners. So when they collaborate with each other, they can able to share what is going on, what they have to teach is up to date. Is this really needed in the industry? What the people, the healthcare managers or healthcare administrators or the public health professionals, what kind of challenges they are facing? So the collaboration make them to understand what are the challenges they are facing and then they can teach according to that in their curriculum. And the same way, if there is some research going on in academics, then they can bring that to the industry to scale up that too. And I will show you uh, later the examples how we did that too. And the most high performance healthcare system in the world is considered the Taiwan's healthcare system. And the reason is because um, it's very convenient for patients that they can go to any hospital and access to the services as long as they are insured. So they can even just have to pay a very small amount of co-payment uh, money because it's all insured. So they are already paying some amount of the money. And one of the interesting thing is that they have very high outpatient visits, which is approximately 15 visits per person per year. So you can imagine that the one person on average in one year visiting 15 times to the hospital, which is actually uh, a lot more compared to US where there are less visits, uh, probably 12. Another important thing is the diagnosis and the drugs coded by physicians themselves. There, so there are no coders. So when, the, when there's any patient who are visiting any hospital or any clinic, um, the physicians, they will see the patient, but they, at the same time, they will also enter the information into computer by themselves in the electronic health records. So you imagine that the physicians who understand about the disease are key in the information in the system by themselves are the one who understand what is exactly this disease and what kind of code is accurate for particular that disease. So because there is a coding system like ICD, um, CM classification. So the physicians, when they are coding by themselves, so they pick the code which is best matches according to their diagnosis. That's why the information we have in the electronic records, we can trust because this is coded by the physician themselves. So they are not coders. So imagine if they are coders, the coders usually get training. However, but they are not expert in, you know, uh, they are not expert physicians or they are not expert in the healthcare uh, field. So they may have chances of some mistakes too. 
So this is one of the uh, key important point as well. Another important thing is the accurate e-prescription, electronic prescription. So in Taiwan, there is an accurate e-prescription. Um, why we call accurate e-prescription is again, because there is a physicians who are also key in the drugs into the system by themselves. So there's no third person who is entering the drugs into the system, which will help to understand that, you know, this is the drugs needed by this particular patient and this is the real drug. One of the key thing here is in case the physician forget to put about the disease code and they're just putting the drugs in the, uh, in the system, the system will give them, um, you know, it will not work because they must have to enter the disease code too, uh, to in order to find the drugs, to prescribe the drugs. And also because the hospitals, they are under the co-payment system. So they are, you know, like all the hospitals, they are under national health insurance. So they have to get the claims from the national health insurance back when they have to submit the data to the national health insurance. So national health insurance system check randomly some sample from the data submitted. And then they see that how much is the error in the submission of the data. So there's some percentage of the data. If, for example, if they submitted 1 million prescriptions and if there's 1% of the from 1 million prescription have some uh, kind of, you know, uh, missing diagnosis and only drugs, then they will give a plenty to the hospital. Means they will not reimburse and they will even give a fine to the hospitals. That's why the hospitals also control the quality of the data before they're submitting to NHI. So they, when the hospital, they have to maintain the quality of the data, they try to uh, educate their physicians and try to tell them that, you know, they have to follow the regulations that they have to uh, have the uh, proper information about the um, data when they are uh, key in the information. So that's that's the one of the way they also control the quality of the data. Another important thing for Taiwan importance of uh, healthcare infrastructure is that they have 23 million people and all the 23 million people are insured uh, under national health insurance. So whoever is traveling to Taiwan and if they are going to stay there more than three months, they must have to be insured under national health insurance system of Taiwan. So even there is one visitor who is going to stay here for six months or one year, they must have to be insured under this system. Once they are insured, so means if they are visiting any hospital, their data will be in that hospital because they will get the national health insurance card, which has a chip. So their information will be in that particular system. And the Taiwan has over 20 years of electronic health record. So you can imagine if someone visited 20 years back, their data, their cohort data can still be monitored in 20 years, like what this particular person or patient went through, which kind of medicines, which kind of diagnosis, or which hospital they visited, all this kind of information is available. And 20 years is a lot of information. Another important point is the standard coding and data structure. So because there is a structure, standard uh, classification, ICDCM classification, there's a drug course, there's a um, ADC classification for drug course, is the standard from WHO. And then Taiwan has their own NHI course, which they can map to the, uh, the international um, classification. So it's a very standard structure of the data here too. Um, if I show you this picture to give you a more a little bit, uh, you know, how exactly it works. So you can see here that, um, that there is, uh, you know, the people uh, who are insured here, right? And when they are insured, if they are visiting any hospital, if they're visiting any hospital, then they will able to, um, you know, they, their information, uh, which is called claim um, data, is going to the National Health Insurance, NHIA. And from NHI, um, you know, they actually paid by the sum of the fees, the premium is paid by the insurers here, uh, the insured people. 
And then there's an NHI IC card, which is they got from the National Health Insurance. When they're visiting hospital, so they are just paying a co-payment to the hospital. And then in reward, they are getting some healthcare services uh, back. And from hospital, hospital usually submit the claim data to the NHIA. And from NHIA, they usually claim when they're, they're submitting claim data, they are usually getting the payments, claim payments back uh, to the hospital. So NHIA, because it's getting a claim data and that claim data is uh, they, before they only had as a research database, they, they established a research database center uh, from where the researchers can able to access the information whenever they want to run any question, but with the permission. However, from last few years, almost six years, they also created called My Health Bank. So because there were the claim data, so they thought besides researchers, how they can empower the patient themselves too. And the reason to empower patients is because the patients, the people, they are paying the premium, right? So they are paying to the government and they have a right that their data is, that's their data, which they are submitting to the government or stakeholders. And they have a right to access to their own information back. If the people, who, they have their information, they are submitting, but they don't have access to their own information, then they will um, you know, feel like uh, it's, over, it's my data, why I don't have access to my own information. That's why the Taiwan government took an initiative by saying that if the data is the people's data, why not they should have access to their own information too. So that's why they created My Health Bank. And the My Health Bank is kind of an application or cloud-based system where the people can see their own medical data information too. So now the question comes here is, if we just provide them uh, data, um, will that make any sense to the people? Because maybe some people, they don't understand any uh, particular information. So we need to do something more than just providing them their own data information. Maybe we should do some kind of, um, you know, messages, which we tell people that you should do this initiative based on your conditions, your disease history. If someone has two or three diseases, maybe we can able to make some prediction models and individualize the treatments, or maybe we can take some public health initiatives and um, individualize or besides some groups and tell them, you know, you need to do exercise, you need to walk because this is your health condition, stuff like that. So this is um, a more focus on my health bank uh, further, that how we can make it more useful for people. Um, so far, it provides the information and they, the people, they can have access to their drugs, like what kind of drugs they have been prescribed. Um, and the one of the another important reason was to control the polypharmacy, because most of people, when they are visiting one hospital and they're visiting second hospital, they are more prone to get the, uh, you know, overlapping of the drugs. So if they are taking so many drugs, first, they may not eat all the drugs because maybe there are similar drugs. And the second, there's a wastage of the, uh, you know, the drugs. So there's a lot of cost involved in that too. So that was one of the um, reason um, uh, also that which, you know, include the one key feature called pharma cloud in the My Health Bank, where they monitor. And because in Taiwan, there is no gatekeeper system that the patients, they are, they can able, they are feel, they are free to choose any uh, hospital they want to go, any specialist they want to see directly without going to GP. If they want to see directly specialist, they can go to the specialist. However, in the UK, in Australia, as you know that, you know, you have to go to GP first and GP have to refer you to the specialist. So there's a control system. But here in Taiwan, it's open. So the patient, they're sometimes, you know, visiting one specialist and at the same time, they can go to another hospital to see another specialist. So that's how they can also take a lot of drugs too. So this kind of um, system can help to control if the patient have took already some drugs from one specialist, Maybe the doctor, when they will use the card, they can able to see what drugs they have been prescribed from the other doctor and they can avoid to have the duplication in that too. So this is uh, just want to explain you how this figure works. 
So this is a kind of a system um, we build based on the, the data we had, the big data. Um, this is called advanced electronic safety of prescriptions model. And the prescription data we were collecting, um, we were thinking that how we can make it useful for people so they can able to, um, you know, like uh, uh, reduce the medication errors because medic medication errors, it was a, one of the big challenge uh, instead until now, there are so many, you know, um, a huge cost involved in medication errors too. So we had the, we tried to build AI enhanced safety of prescription because there was an opportunity that we have a lot of information, a huge amount of data. So we use the AI, <clears throat> artificial intelligence and we try to build a model which is called and we had almost 700 million prescriptions and which all these prescriptions have 1.3 billion diagnoses and 2.5 billion medications <clears throat> and you imagine that around 16,000 variables and 400 doctors and we use a machine learning, which was unsupervised method. And then we found that there was 75% to 90% agreement by expert reviewers. So who were expert reviewers? We had the doctors and we had the pharmacist. We give them some random prescriptions. And also we um, also check from our model. So we, come, we try to compare the results. When we give them the manual prescriptions to the human beings, uh, ex human experts like doctors and pharmacists, and we ask them, can you please check if this prescription is appropriate or inappropriate? What do you think about those prescriptions? And then the results were almost 75%, 90% agreement between the machine and the human experts. So this was very interesting. And so it means we can rely on the machines. The figure I'm showing here is D1, D2, D3 is, this is actually, you can imagine this is like one example of prescription. If, imagine if this is one prescription, D1, D2, D3, and uh, there are maybe five medications, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. And this is how the associations are. For example, one disease can have two or three drugs, right? And sometimes there are some disease too, maybe have only one drug. So this is how, you know, we had the association based uh, model. And <clears throat> we found that there was like, you know, 75%, 90% agreement. So which was very helpful. And we tried to implement that too in the real settings. Based on that project, we able to publish two papers. So one paper we published in plus one, the, because in Taiwan, there's another uh, opportunity is that the allopathic medicines are <clears throat> prescribed. Uh, and also the Chinese medicine, Chinese traditional medicine also prescribed in the system too. So there's also the data available for the Chinese traditional medicines as well, the prescriptions data. So we also had the, um, you know, the publication, we try to see the same model how the allopathic medicine and this Chinese medicine, they work together and you see that, you know, they um, uh, maybe sometimes there is some interaction of the drugs between allopathic and Chinese traditional medicine too, right? Because Chinese med traditional medicine is also a drug. So when the people are taking allopathic drug and Chinese traditional medicine, they, uh, they can also have interaction. So we try to build, a, we try to use the same model and try to implement on that. And we try to publish this one as well. Then we also try to do one project using the big data or it's called observational health data on long-term drug use and cancer. And the reason to do long-term drug use and cancer risk is because there are so many drugs which people usually take to treat one disease. But we never know that those drugs have a long-term carcinogenic effect or mutagenic effect for particular cancers. And sometimes we are just trying to treat one disease, but we ending up having another disease. And most of the pharma companies, they are not doing post-marketing surveillance for a really, really long time because one is costly, second is time-taking, and the third, it's very hard to you know, secure uh, the information. 
or to recruit the subjects for that too. So we try to um, explore this and we use 2 million cohort sample from 1999 to 2013. And these long-term use drugs, uh, we try to see the top uh, 10 cancers in Taiwan. And we try to stratify, stratify with the age and gender as well and with different age groups as well. So this paper we published uh, in 2015 called is long-term use of benzodiazepine a risk for cancer? So why we focus on benzodiazepine is because a lot of people here takes benzodiazepine just for depression, anxiety, or you know they feel tired from the work. So they just take these drugs. And these drugs, actually, we try to see that when the people, they are taking these drugs and they become dependent on these drugs, how much impact uh, and what kind of impact long-term on the cancers. And we interestingly found that the people who use the benzodiazepines for more than you know uh, six months and one year regular, they have a risk to develop certain kind of cancers. And some of the drugs have even more carcinogenic effect compared to the other drugs within the same class of benzodiazepines. So this was only possible when we can able to do the use the observational health data, with a huge amount of information which we can able to do. And interesting thing was that this paper, and we also have done some other research on benzodiazepine, were cited in the petition which was filed to FDA US uh, about asking to revise the guidelines of prescribing antibiotics, uh, sorry, the benzodiazepines or sleeping pills. And why? Why? Because most of the studies, they were saying that the benzodiazepines, because it's been in the market for a very long time and people are using these drugs. So the researchers were coming and saying that, you know, these drugs have carcinogenic effect. If people are taking for long term, they may have cancer, ending up with cancer. So this, the Dr. Kripke, he, he also famous on, and he's doing a lot of research on sleeping pills and benzodiazepines as well. So he read that and he also uh, cited over two studies in his petition and asking FDA to revise the benzodiazepine guidelines after so many years, it's like 40 to 50 years, that you can imagine that there were never ever, um, there's any guidelines revised for prescribing the benzodiazepines. This is the impact of policy. You can see that how much impact. This is uh, <clears throat> another study. We also use uh, the data, observational big data. And then we also use um, the genomic data available. And the reason we use this um, genomic data here, uh, the publicly available genomic data is because when we use observational health data only, then people were saying that this is just an observational data. How you can say, just observing, that you don't know if people really take the medicine or not because it's just the data in the system, right? The, if, if some doctor prescribing medicine to one patient for 30 days, but doctor cannot see exactly that if this person really have took this medicine or not, but we just can assume that this person took the medicine. So then we also, then we, we thought maybe we should develop a new methodology which can help to see that, you know, how we can provide the real evidence. So we also try to use uh, genomic data, which was publicly available. And we focus on one cancer only. And we try to combine the observational health data results and the genomic expression, gene expression, profiling evidence, and the drug signals. And we published this in General Biomedic Informatics. So this was a new methodology we introduced to combine the two approaches together. Another, um, this study was published in top second journal after Lancet, which is the Clinical Infectious Diseases call. And in Taiwan, there was a regulation introduced that 
to control the antibiotic resistance, that the physicians should not prescribe antibiotics to um, if they don't get any lab result before. For example, if any patient visiting to any physician, and then the physician should first order the lab test. If the lab test is positive, if there is, a, if there is an infection comes, then the physician should prescribe the antibiotic and then start with the first line antibiotic, second line antibiotic, and third line. However, before the physician, whenever anybody goes there and the physician just suspect, they were just able to prescribe the antibiotics. But after this policy, they cannot prescribe the antibiotics, so they have to wait. So when they have to wait for the lab test, then if they prescribe, then the hospital will give them a plenty there to the physician that why you prescribe the medicine without the lab test. So we, we saw, we try to see the trends that after that policy implication, what was the physician's antibiotic prescribing behavior? And we saw that it was suddenly declined after that policy implication because it was a strict policy implication. And then we found that there was a, the prescribing behavior for antibiotic went down drastically which was very interesting trends. And this is how they're trying to control the antibiotic resistance as well and unnecessary antibiotic prescription. Um, this is another study which is talking about the social media because sometimes people, they hesitate to share uh, the information with their friends um, face to face. So they feel like they can just share uh, the information on social media. So this was a collaboration study uh, with Australia, some partners, and they tried to see that on the Twitter, and sometimes the people, when they take the drugs, they have some adverse reaction like rashes, or, you know, they feel vomiting, or maybe the, you know, some um, vertigo. I mean, so many different kinds of the uh, adverse events. And some most of time they just want to uh, you know uh, tweet like oh I took this medicine I feel like that so this uh, in this study we try to extract the Twitter uh, data and to see the adverse drug reactions and uh, we found that it was interesting that the people they can they try to express more on social media compared to the one they directly report to the hospitals. So there's less reporting to hospitals compared to the more on the Twitter, on social media. So this is one of the, another example uh, of the project of big data where uh, we call phenome wide association study. And in this study, we use the 22 million population data and we try to build a system uh, which can help to see that what kind of the diseases are associated with other diseases. And you can be able to, you know, even see this, there's a link available on this, pvas.tme.ed.tw. If you copy this link and you, you know, search on this you, uh, on your devices, you can able to see that, you can able to find the in Taiwan, uh, the diseases uh, which are associated to each other. And you can able to see that how many people, they are co-occurrence as well, like if they have one disease, uh, what are the other kind of disease they have? And they can, you can also able to see the p-value and odd ratio as well. So, but this is only for the outpatient visitors, uh, not for the inpatient visitors. And the reason to do this one is to see the comorbidity diseases. Like if the patient have one disease, what kind of other diseases they are more likely to get in the next upcoming years too. The same thing we try to also visualize. And when we visualize this, we call this disease map. Disease map is like a galaxy map. So you can see here, it's like a galaxy and the different colors of the galaxy shows a different disease system. And this one map also you can see in your uh, computer devices is openly available too. And the distance between the two circles shows that how close these diseases to each other. And the different colors show different systems and the size of the each galaxy ball shows that how many people have this particular disease uh, in that particular system. So 
And if you click on that particular galaxy, you can able to see the ICD code for that disease. And you can also see the other related diseases and you can also see the R, R ratios for that. And this is a three year prevalence information. So you can imagine that within three years uh, for the outpatient, if the person have one disease, you can able to see what are the other diseases more uh, this patient had um, in that particular three uh, years time frame. So you can able to see the patient's condition. And the interesting thing is different age groups. So you can check you can check the different age groups, uh, the 10 to 20 years uh, boys will have different diseases compared to 10 to 20 years uh, female. And it's the same, you know, if there are males who are 40 to uh, 50, they have different diseases compared to the females. And it, the galaxy will change automatically when you key in, in the information in that. So we published this uh, two papers out of this as well into international journals. The first was Profile Genome Association and the second was in the CMPB. <clears throat> Since there's a huge amount of data and sometimes people, it, it is very hard for people to understand the information. So there was a new trend called visualization. So we also try to follow that how we can make it, you know, the, visual, the visualization um, means easy for people to understand because most of people, they don't understand the data. If you give them the numbers, they will feel, uh, you know, frustrated because they don't know what to do exactly with, with those numbers. So we thought, why not we should use some kind of uh, diagrams, some visualization tools, which can help them to, um, you know, understand better. So you can see here one figure, this figure is called Sankey diagram. We took the data 1 million from 1998 to 2011, and we tried to see and visualize the polymorbidity associated with the chronic kidney disease. So imagine if the patient have a chronic kidney disease, what before getting, getting chronic kidney disease, what kind of the diseases uh, he or she had before. So we can able to see before, which is called pre-CKD. So when the patient was healthy, after what kind of diseases they get before getting to CKD. And then after CKD, we also want to see what kind of the outcomes this particular patient had. For example, some patients go for hemodialysis, some people go for peritoneal dialysis, some just go for renal transplantation, and some may have a mortality. So, and some who get a stable after CKD or treatment, we see that how many stable and how many also have the mortality too. So you can imagine just by looking at the diagram or by clicking on the diagram, you can able to project uh, the patients, uh, what, how many patients have what. The same figure, if you want to see here, you can see here that there's a pre-CKD and post-CKD. When you click on one node, you can able to see the different colors shows the different diseases. And you can see that how many patients, um, you know, before CKD, what kind of disease they had and post-CKD, what were the outcomes? So based on that, we can design the policy that which kind of patients coming with what kind of particular diseases needed to go for dialysis or which are having high risk, which are having high cost. And then based on that, we can able to decide what to do. So the two studies we published out of this <clears throat> as well into international journals. Since I mentioned about the visualization uh, about the CKD, we also try to see that how we can able to predict the cancer in 36 months. So for example, uh, we use the 36 months data and we try to predict the cancer in next 12 months. So this is an example of liver cancer. So <clears throat> we took almost uh, 80K liver cancer patients and we also had 320K controls and we had the 2,700 variables. We use the machine learning here and we also use a time matrix uh, into images and we found there there was a 94 percent accuracy for this model that if we have a one patient or we have a one patient with particular you know um, 
uh, information of 36 months of personal health record, we can able to predict based on their information of uh, these three years that whether this patient is going to have a liver cancer in next 12 months or not. So which was very interesting as well. So imagine if we if a patient will able to know before that they are going to have a liver cancer, they may take some precautionary measures instead getting cancer and then after starting treatment. This project is, is the example of imaging data. Before we were talking about the electronic health record data, observational health data, which was recorded as a claim data, like patients visiting different hospitals, they have EHR data and we just you know, use that EHR data. But this one is more about the imaging data. So imagine we go to the hospital, we have a lot of x-rays, we do a lot of CD scans. We also have so many other image data. So this is an example where we develop an app which is called the Molmi. And if the, you can take the picture, if anyone has a mole on their skin, they can take a picture from this app and then the app will able to tell the, uh, the person whether this mole have a risk to develop into cancer, melanoma, or not. So if they think that this is a risky mole, you may need to visit to the hospital, then it will suggest you to go to the uh, doctor to see the doctor. And this one also had the 90% accuracy. So you can imagine that um, we develop this based on the data, the information, and we want to see that whether, you know, if any patient, because sometimes people visit randomly to the hospital, they just worry about that. And sometimes some people, if they are at risk, they don't visit to the hospital. So these kind of apps can help them to reduce the unnecessary visits to the hospital, unnecessary cost to the hospital, and also provide the accurate, uh, almost diagnosis, uh, like suggestion, and also, and the people who are at risk to suggest them to timely visit to the doctors as well. So we used 3000 patients for, and four dermatologists were involved and we had the five variables only, images plus five variables. So we use the machine learning. And this project is now uh, become a you know, startup company. And this is also getting approved from Taiwan FDA and US FDA too. So, so far I just give you an examples of, uh, you know, the how we were using the data and building some models or how we were visualizing the data within Taiwan, right? But now I would focus on, if you just do the things within Taiwan, some may, countries may think or may ask, um, you know, this is uh, based on Taiwan. What, what is the implication for the other countries? how we can generalize the findings to the other countries. So for that, we, we joined the global community, which is called Odyssey, Observational Health Data Science and Informatics Community. So many countries have joined uh, this consortium. It's free to join. You don't have to have any you know, fees or something. It's just voluntarily join and if you can learn from them too. And if you have a data, you can convert to the common data model. And the common data model is a platform which you don't need to share your data. You just have to share the results. So you, because we understand that there is a constraint that the people, uh, there is a government stakeholders policies that you cannot share the healthcare information. So this consortium allows you only share the results, not your data, but your data has to be converted to the common data model because the common data model uh, is a common for everyone, no matter hospital A, hospital B, or country A or country B using different kind of um, health information system. But the common data model dictionary will be same. So you map to your data to that one kind of structure and then you can able to share. The advantage of this one is that if you want to run the same question on different countries, you can able to do that. So imagine if you want to see the same results in Taiwan 
And the same question you want to run in Indonesia, same question you want to run in US or in UK, you can able to do that. So if, for example, if the, your data from Indonesia is converted to CDM model, uh, Taiwan and the US also, so they can run on their own common data model and they can share the results. And <clears throat> this one is showing a little bit more that the tools are open source tools available. And the one example you can see here is like in, Ta in UK, they were using, they are using the disease code, which is called read. And in Korea, they use the disease code KCD. And in Taiwan, they're using the ICD codes. And, but the all from the common dictionary, they use the snowman. So they can map the data to there. For this one, you can do either single studies, means one-to-one -one study, or you can do the multiple studies as well. So it depends on you that how, how you would like to do the studies. Because it's a real-time query, you can able to do the real-time study. You don't have to wait. And so, for example, if somebody wants to do some study, they can just, you know, query real time and they can able to get that because the data is available there and data is already in the common data model. And the tools are available free as well. And uh, Dr. Martin from um, Johnson Johnson helped us to establish this in Taiwan. And in Taiwan, we also <clears throat> established uh, Taiwan Odyssey chapter as well. So in the chapter, we try to include more and more hospitals uh, to contribute the data to this consortium. So <clears throat> these are the two studies we publish internationally uh, with collaboration with other countries. So you can see that the first study is application of common data model to rank the periodic user and prescription prevalence of 15 different drug classes in South Korea, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in Japan, and in Australia. So you imagine that the same question we run in five different countries. And we're able to see that what kind of the pediatric you know, drugs, uh, what is the prescription prevalence in these 15, different, uh, 15 different drugs in these different countries. And we publish in BMJ Open. <clears throat> So it is very interesting to see even your neighboring countries like Japan and Korea, that what are the similar and different trends about prescribing the drugs for the same, you know, the same question. And then there's another study we published. Uh, this was a collaboration with the US, UK, and Canada. It's a multinational investigation of fracture risk and antidepressant use by class, drug, and indication. We want to see that the people <clears throat> who are taking antidepressant drugs, what are the trends for them for the risk to get a fracture? So we want to compare the findings in US, in UK and Taiwan to see what if it, it is different or is it the same? And these studies got a lot of media exposure as well because it's an international collaboration. You can see here, of course, it's in Chinese. Sorry for that. Uh, but just showing you that it, it got a lot of media exposure here uh, that we built the Taiwan chapter of Odyssey and we were doing the international studies, which is a very exceptional good uh, thing. Now we move to Taiwanese COVID-19 initiatives. Because now there is 19 and everybody was talking about data sharing. They were saying that, you know, since we did not have the uh, good measures for data sharing, so they were unable to uh, control, you know, some measures. If there was a timely data sharing, maybe some countries can still control and avoid the pandemic. This is a viewpoint which published in the JAMA one of the author from uh, US and he talked about the uh, Jason Wong he talked about the response to COVID-19 in Taiwan and this this letter provides a very good insights that how the big data analytics new technology and proactive testing help Taiwan to control the COVID-19 so first of all <clears throat> big data analytics because Taiwan, we know there's a health IT infrastructure. And 
what one of the initiatives Taiwan took is when people, they were traveling from the other countries, uh, even though they were, you know, suggested to do the quarantine, if somebody feel any symptoms, they go to the nearby hospital. And sometimes, you know, the patient don't want to disclose to their physicians that they were on traveling or they were coming from somewhere, right? Because this is a common human nature. So what should be done for that? Taiwan government linked the immigration data to the national health insurance data. And the why they did that is because they learned from the SARS experience, which happened before several years where the people they were you know not disclosing the information and then they were threat to the healthcare professionals when the immigration data to the national health insurance data whenever any person who were visiting any hospital nearby the doctor because they use the nhi card so the doctor, when they, they put the card in the car reader, they can able to retrieve the information that where this person was traveling before through their immigration data history. So from, even though the physician will ask, maybe the patient don't want to tell, but they have symptoms. But from there, uh, from the car, the, patient, the physician can see the information where they were traveling. So the phys physician don't have to tell to the patient directly, they just, uh, suggest the measures that you know you have to take this or they will take the precautions according to that too so you can imagine this is also one way to control um, that how you can monitor the information and how you can monitor using this big data and control the epidemic that you can see that where the person was traveling the travel history and their previous history and then based on that you can suggest uh, the guidelines and another thing was their testing because if they suspect and then based on that, they only do the testing. They, do, they don't do the testing for all the population because they think that this might be, you know, unnecessary cost one. And then also, you know, the time. And also, you know, there are so many people who are not at risk. So maybe they don't need testing at all. So that was also the one of the good major initiatives. One of the interesting major was my health bank utilization. So my health bank, I mentioned in the beginning that the Taiwan government now provide the data in the my health bank where people can have access to their own information. And this my health bank is a web-based system and also it is an app, uh, mobile app. However, um, so the patient, they can see the information like this. For example, there's the one uh, I share you is the healthcare data of their CKD disease uh, there's a health education website, there's the dental information. If the patient visits to any dental clinic, they can see their information. So this kind of information is available on my health bank. But in COVID-19, you know, there was a lot of problem about the healthcare resources. So many countries, they were having lack of face masks and somewhere the people were having misuse of the resources. So how you can manage the resources during this time? So Taiwan took one great initiative is they introduced the e-mask function through my health bank. So what is e-mask function? First, you know that if some people, they have to buy the mask, they have to go to the pharmacy. And if they have to go to the pharmacy or any store, they have to stay in the queue for a long time. When, first of all, when they have to go to the pharmacy, they have to spend time to go there. And when they are staying in the queue, they may have risk to get the infection from other people who are standing in the queue too. So there are so many old people as well who are standing in the queue for a long, long time. The third thing is even though they go to the pharmacy or they stand in the queue, how you can know that this person have bought before? and they are not going to buy again, right? So this was very important thing. So what, what Taiwan government introduced e-mask function. So from e-mask function, the people, they can reserve online the face mask. They can reserve online the face mask and then um, they, they use the NHI card because they have already given the card. So if they log in through their card, 
the go the government the stakeholders can see that this person from this card can only able to buy three masks per week so if the same person is going to buy want to buy the again mask within a week because their card information is already there so they cannot able to uh buy again because three masks is enough for uh, one week for one person so and the second thing is they can choose the nearby pharmacy so when they're buying this they can choose the nearby pharmacy and then they can collect when they are going from office back let's say if they are going to the office and after work they want to pick up the nearby home pharmacy if they have order in the daytime they can able to pick from there so this is how it can help to control that how many people can buy uh, the mass per week and they don't have to be in the queue they can save the time they can pay online they don't have to worry about you know staying in a queue or they don't have to be you know um, getting more chances of risk to get infection from other two so this feature was very helpful and people really appreciate that too using the emails function by my helping because most of people they were having because everyone has the nhi card so this is how you can monitor and this was in English uh, service as well and Chinese too, so people can understand and they were uh, doing this. So you can see here. This <clears throat> paper is published from our research group, a lab. This paper is showing that when in Taiwan, every year there was a cold flu, seasonal flu uh, in January, February. But since the COVID-19, the people were wearing the mask, face mask. The face mask helped to control a lot, the flu. The flu went down. The cases went down dr drastically. So you can see here the results, just wearing a mask can help them to stay away from the normal flu as well. So it was very interesting as well. So because people have to wear the mask for during COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but it also helped them from the normal flu. So this paper is a recent paper published. Uh, I think one of the uh, co-author is Dina. Um, and I uh, also thanks her for her recommendation for this talk as well. So <clears throat> Dina is also a um, doctor candidate here. Um, doing her PhD in biomedical informatics and uh, along with the Anisa student. This paper is talking about the social media data analytics for outbreak risk communication from Indonesia. So during COVID-19, you know, people, they are in panic. They usually have frustration. They usually share information on the social media. So when they are in panics and social media there is so much kind of different kind of information sometimes there is a good information sometimes there is a bad information means some fake information so how you can you know control this information they collected you know <clears throat> 284,000 tweets uh, from the active users from 137,000 uh, active users and then they analyze this one so i think this is a one of the good study uh, you all may want to look into for see that how the government can take uh, some measures for policy making uh, about the social media and you know the other uh, social media platforms where people can use this information the people who are trying to uh, you know explore on the um, social media um, <clears throat> this is the paper we published called uh, earlier medicine. So earlier medicine term we coined. And what we are trying to say here is that nowadays we have a lot of information, a huge amount of information. How we can use this information and we can see that this information can be useful for having the earlier prevention. So even though there's earlier medicine, we think that there is a AI can be used for primary prevention, for secondary prevention, and for tertiary prevention. So there's a different kind of levels. And we also suggested in this paper that the AI can be actionable, it can be accurate, 
it can be timely and it can be individualized. Means you don't have to do everything for everyone. You can target some people particular and then you can design the treatments according to that or you can able to uh, see you know who need. For example, there's a chronic care. So AI, AI can help to predict the disabilities. And then there's an acute care where, uh, where you can have that disease progression. For example, if somebody have diabetes, you can see if the person is doing exercise or not and you know how the diabetes is progressing with time. And prevention care, for example, if somebody have some kind of symptoms, you can able to predict earlier what kind of disease this person is going to have that. And this paper is published in Journal of Medical Internet Research. And in, uh, we have co-author from Howard uh, University, uh, Dr. Leo, and Jack Lee from Taiwan Medical University. He's uh, also a pioneer in medical informatics in Taiwan. And also globally, he has a lot of contribution in informatics. And he's also the uh, president-elect for International Medical Informatics Association as well. <clears throat> so, this paper also got a lot of exposure in the news. And again, apology for, you know, it's, everything is in Chinese here because the news in Taiwan, you know, is mostly in Chinese. So that's why, but I'm just sharing here to show you that uh, what was the impact of this research paper publication uh, got a lot of media attention. This uh, paper is uh, about the recent systematic review we published. This systematic review and meta-analysis is about the impact of diabetes, self-management, education, um, you know, a support kind of app interventions for medication adherence in type two diabetes mellitus. And I, the reason I want to share you this paper is it's just a recent paper published. And to give an example to those students or those lecturers who, who don't know where to start about this, health informatics is something. They can start from the review kind of papers or meta-analysis paper as well. And they can able to do some kind of this. They can see the impact of some digital interventions on particular activities or particular initiatives. And then they can design a well-designed study and they can able to uh, publish that too. And it was very interesting because nowadays this is a digital era. Everybody has access to the technology. Internet is more cheaper. Everybody is using mobile devices. They can able to have self-education if we have any videos and other material. So we, we want to see how people can maintain their, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the, uh, what is their medication for this particular case. These are the two book chapters. Uh, I will recommend you to, if you're interested to see the Taiwan uh, how Taiwan Health Information Technology Journey from Flash Drive to Health Cloud. And uh, because Taiwan started in the beginning where they, they use a USB to keep your health record. And nowadays they have a health cloud, means you don't need to carry anything with you. Just go to the doctor with a card and they can able to access your information from the cloud. And another thing is my data, my decision. So means from big data to now they want to make an open data. So the people, because the data is contributed by the people, so they should have a right to access to their own information. How come the people are contributing their information and they don't have a right to access to their own information? So that's what we also wrote in this chapter. These two books are published from uh, the leading editor, Professor Jeffrey Breifert from Australia, from Macquarie University, and some other uh, editors from different countries. So this is <clears throat> the future. Uh, what is the future is because we have opportunity to collect a lot of information. So people will have a smart homes, which is already, uh, you can control smart home from your mobile app. Uh, the doctors, they can, uh, you can have a monitor, like, you know, telemedicine, one example. There's a health network. There's a smart city because, you know, there's a train system where we will have the internet during traveling. Uh, in the cars, people have smart cars. You can see that there are some examples already of the smart cars is uh, self-driving cars, but then maybe the cars will also have some 
more features which can help to monitor person's health inside the car or any office in the offices people now have different kind of sensors which can monitor person's health and in the shopping centers so this is a kind of you know the, the future where everywhere you will have sensors and nowadays you can see that there are the wearable devices that which can monitor your 24 seven health uh, from your respiratory rate, your heart rate, your body temperature, your walking style, your sleeping patterns. If all this information we can combine, we can build and we can able to make a, you know, good predictive models, which can help us to uh, improve our lives. This is, uh, I like from Dr. Eric Topol. He is the pioneer in AI in medicine. So people ask few questions and uh, he uh, try to answer them. For example, what is the biggest problem you see in medicine today? How do we establish that relationship? And people can track their health uh, now with their smartphones. So is that a good thing? If you use the smartphone to monitor your health, what are the best examples of how AI can work in medicine? And is there really artificial intelligence in the sense that the machine has learned about medicine like doctors? Do we think that the machines can replace doctors or they can learn exactly like doctors? And what worries people most about AI in medicine? And will ever have an AI doctor to take care of all of our medical needs? So this is, um, very interesting, and um, that's why I'm here, here, and you can further read into detail. So in conclusion, we, we think that, you know, that based on the big data and our intelligence, we have now a day's capacity that we can have a speed and accuracy of diagnosis. We can do faster diagnosis and speed. We don't have to go and wait for uh, doctors outside the clinic for one hour, two hour. If we have the technology, we have a good technology and we can have a, a speed and accuracy of diagnosis from the devices. And even sometimes people don't have to travel too far. Uh, another thing is early prevention and personalized treatments. By having the big data or you know AI, we can able to have early, early prevention, means we can prevent earlier from happening something and also we can personalize the treatments. We can individualize the groups. We can see that, you know, uh, which group needed what kind of treatment. And the reason is because we have an opportunity that all kind of data is available. We have data from electronic records. We have data from the wearable devices. We have data from the, you know, different devices in the home if sensors we have. And we, Nowadays can use AI for virtual trials and also for remote monitoring. So you can imagine this is a capacity now by having the data and the potential for global health improvement and patient safety as well, using all this uh, information. This is a course uh, we have from Taipei American University, AI and Big Data and Global Health Improvement. If anyone is interested, they can feel free to join this course. And if you, um, of course, if you will, uh, this is a free course, but if you will ask Future Learn to give you a Future Learn certificate, then it will ask you to pay. However, if you finish the course and you don't have to get, if you're not interested in Future Learn certificate, you can drop me an email and I can provide you a certificate for free, um, which is from Oversight too, if you're interested in that too. And for this course, we have people from Harvard University, from Australia, from Korea, uh, and from Taiwan, uh, which give you an ex, you know, exposure that how AI and big data can help in global health improvement. This is uh, a journal which I share with you that we have a new journal from elsewhere, which is called Computer Method and Program in Biomedicine Update which is a sister journal of computer method and program in biomedicine. So the names are very similar. That journal has 3.4 impact factor, but this journal, uh, because I am an EIC editor in chief. So I encourage all of you, if you are interested to submit the papers and we can provide the fast track. Um, all the faculty members are also encouraged to submit the papers to this particular journal. 
and um, the publication fees is free until September 2021. So you, if you have any question uh, regarding paper or something, you can see the author guidelines as well. So you can able to contact me as direct, uh, directly as well, or you can contact Dr. Farid or uh, Dina, so they can communicate with me as well. There is no problem at all. And I always encourage the publications coming from, you know, the different sources and different groups, and especially I encourage the people who are new into research and they, or they are not well established in the research, but they are really interested to publish into international journals as well. So this is a good opportunity for all of you. And we also have two special issues now uh, in this one. And these two special issues are um, um, on, one is on digital health literacy, I think, which is very interesting. And we have a, uh, the guest editor for this particular special issue is from UK and Denmark. And uh, that she has experience even working with WHO as well. And the second special issue is on blockchain technologies in healthcare. So if any one of you is interested, you can able to submit to special issue as well, or you can submit to the normal journal as well. There is no problem at all. Uh, again, I would like to thank you to all of you, Dr. Farid and uh, uh, you know, all the team members uh, for having me here. And now I'm open for question and answers. And for, okay. for him, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Usman. It is very interesting lecture. Uh, until now, this your presentation give me many encourage me to use the big data because currently it is a little bit uh, difficult to use the big data due to the permission. Yes, <laughs> due to the, the permission, the, the legality of the data is quite, quite difficult in here. But this idea make me, or uh, maybe all the all the participants here would like to increase their capability to analyze the big data because it is very rare. Maybe you can see in the in the international journal there is almost no of author from Indonesia that speak, that write down about <laughs> the big data. Okay, for the question and answer, maybe I will let one or two participants who can give directly the question to Prof. Kusman. Actually, here I already noted many questions here. They have six questions, but now I will give the opportunity to participant to give directly the question to Prof. Kusman. Please, you can either use Bahasa Indonesia or in English. If you use Bahasa Indonesia, I will translate for Prof. Kusman. Please, you can raise your hand. No one? <laughs> okay. If there is no one, if no one, then oh no no, this I one ask questions. Krishnopal Anugra, please, you can you can give the question. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat Wa sore. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore. Hi Prof. Osman, so great presentation. Okay. Uh, uh, Kepada Dr. Farid, izin bertanya. Oke, okay, silahkan. Nah, ini uh, big data, terutama dalam big data. Big data, bila kita lihat, uh, terutama data apakah termasuk big data atau tidak, setahu saya itu dari segi karakteristik volume, variety, velocity, veracity, veracity atau kebenaran. Tapi uh, data yang besar yang sudah terkumpul itu kadang-kadang kita kesulitan how use uh, recommend, recommended software to analyze it analyze the data uh, okay. terutama bagi orang yang uh, tidak mengerti tentang uh, data engineer uh, tentang penggunaan karena 
ada yang bicara tentang uh, software Cloudera tentang tapi kita harus menggunakan software ataupun server dari luar negeri jadi kita menghosting ataupun uh, menyewa server untuk menganalisis jadi uh, budgeting is uh, too expensive uh, jadi rekomendasi untuk menganalisi menganalisis uh, dari suatu data itu apa uh, software recommendation uh, terutama bagi para uh, pemula seperti kita untuk ataupun para research untuk menganalisis datanya terutama yang sangat besar nanti uh, terutama big data ini memang suatu yang uh, uh, masih baru menurut saya ya jadi uh, saya mohon uh, pencerahannya thank you thank you oke okay, thank you uh, oke okay, thank you I will translate for Prof Usman the data we have the problem here if we use the kind of the big data the first problem problem is about the software uh, what kind of software that you recommended for the beginner this is the first one and the second one is about the source of the data for example is there any uh, free data that we can access something like that okay you can answer this question thank you it's very uh, interesting question thank you for that and it's very important because First of all, it depends on the type of data you are going to analyze. Then depend on that, you have to use a software. The most important or common software you really should learn, which encourage to do and can be utilized in, in, in several uh, different um, situations is R, R, R packages. R packages. This is one of the... Um, Thing. Second, because our library has so many different kind of uh, features which can be used in different different situations, and it's very helpful and it's more convenient to learn compared to the other one. As for so far, the students mentioned to me. Um, the second thing is regarding the open access available data. So there are a lot of databases which are available open, and you can search. And also, may, I can also share if any paper. I think there was some uh, publications already published online, which shows that which are the data which are available for public, online, free to use. One example is MIT Critical Data Base. MIT Critical Database is from the Howard University, from the MIT affiliated institution. Uh, which is about for the only ICU database for the patients who are in ICUs that data is available and that avail data is available open means anyone who would like to do that research just can go and you know uh, request to access the information and you can able to use that data and there are this is just one example I'm giving you for the hospital uh, ICU data but there are several other databases which are available open too for example, like the one paper I mentioned about the genomic, if you're interested in genomic research, then you can able to see the link database, L-I-N-C-C, links database. Um, and also uh, there is uh, some other public available database as well. Uh, yeah, so Dina has shared the link as well, which is called mimic.physiology okay. database. So this is a free open available database about the uh, ICU database uh, of the hospital. And I think uh, nowadays there are more and more database available open too. So you just have to search and see. And also sometimes some paper publish who mentioned about the free database available. And it depends on your research interest question. So for example, if you're interested in uh, doing research on ICU patients, so you will maybe interested to um, use the mimic database. If you are interested to do some research on genomic, then you may be able to go to the link database or TICC database. The paper I mentioned, you can able to see that there are two freely available databases we used for that too. And if you are interested in um, some kind of 
WHO or other kind of survey questionnaire information which collected and the database, then you have to go to their website and check uh, the information. I think there are a lot of information available on that too, so free. So nowadays, excuse me, sorry. So nowadays there are more people, uh, more stakeholders, they are willing to contribute uh, data openly. And that's why we're trying to say that, you know, that it should be open, then the people can able to access the uh, data researchers and they can able to um, utilize and um, make it more valuable. Because even you have seen some examples when the, someone publish a paper, nowadays the editor will ask you that, is your data available upon request to reviewers uh, or only to editor or is it op available open? So why they're asking is, and they're asking if it's not available, then whether you will be uh, providing a permission to be providing this data. Because if you cannot provide the data, then how the people can trust on your research? Because if you will provide your data open, then the, maybe somebody have any concern, they can able to run the same uh, question on the same data and able, able to see the results. So this is why nowadays, uh, encouraging to have a uh, data should be available. So there are so many databases which are open, available. One example, the link uh, just Dina has shared in the chat, uh, which you can see that is very, it's a very good database. And we have built some, um, you know, we use this database in our data thons here in TMU and with the MIT, and also as a lot of studies published using this database in prestigious journals like Digit Lancer Digital Health. So yeah, I think it's very helpful. Yeah, and you can try to see, and it depends on the research question too. Did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> it is It is very clear. Your answer is very clear. Pak, Pak Chris, uh, terima kasih atas pertanyaannya. Uh, sangat jelas sekali bahwa banyak sekali open access Dari data yang ada, ini Bu Dina, thank you very much. You already post the link for us, thank you very much. And Pak Chris, you can copy the link okay, to get kasih. the, ya, yeah. terima kasih kembali, Pak Chris. Thank you very much, Pak Chris. And now, we, uh, I noted several questions from the chat. This question is come from our head of program study, Bu Chris Wardani. Uh, she is very, very interested in the utility of big data. The first question is about the, what is the characteristic of big data? It is uh, very technical. And then the second one, what kind of software that you recommended to, to do the kind of research that we can do? Because mostly the big data, uh, the big data software is using the Linux space. So we have to type something in this very, very unconvenient for the beginner. Maybe for this one first. I, I, I have the six question here. Maybe I read for these two first and then after that we continue. Okay. okay. Please. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Farid for passing on this important question again. So as I mentioned that the Excuse me. Uh, okay. Mute. Prof. Osman, you can unmute. Okay. Yeah. unmute. Okay, it's okay now. Um, yeah, so what I was saying is, um, thank you for passing on this question. It's very important. And uh, again, the software is depend on the type of data you are going to analyze and the quantity of the data you are going to analyze. Mm -hmm. Some of the data is if in a you know small number you, sometimes you can use just spss and uh, software <coughs> but some of the data you have to use uh, r sometimes you have to use some other library packages uh, what we usually suggest to use the r is because it has a lot of different features and it can help to have in the multiple situations so one problem we always heard from students is that they have to learn the queries and stuff. So informatics domain is a collaborative domain. 
So what we always suggest is to work in collaboration with someone who understand how to run the data. So at least you can have an accurate results. Yes. And then you collaborate with them and then, uh, you know, design a study together and then ask them to help you to run the information um, on that particular using that command. For example, some database, they need the SQL command Sometimes the R packages, sometimes there is a SPSS on one person. If they are not data scientists, they are not aware of all these kind of te techniques. So that's why this informatics domain is a multidisciplinary team. So we encourage them to work together with the different backgrounds. So if someone is with a public health background, they should work with the data science or computer science or someone who understands and run, um, um, can able to run or at least you need to develop some basic skills to understand the data, uh, like how to run. So R is uh, the common um, um, statistical software we suggest. And yeah. it's also free available. That's why I also suggested that. Uh, regarding the, uh, the second question was sorry about that, the type of the data, right? The type, yeah, the type of, of the data, the characteristic of big data. Yeah, so wh why we call big data is because of the four weeks, right? Because one, the data is coming so fast, it's so fast accumulating data. So imagine like a healthcare data. If one person is visiting 15 times to the hospital per year, and if there's 23 million population, and one person if visiting one, uh, one time, they have prescription, maybe, you know, in one prescription, they have maybe five or 10 drugs, or one to two diagnosis. So you can imagine that how much information it would be for 23 million. And second thing and lab test and other things also include then the, it's a lot of information. Besides that, nowadays there is a real time monitoring, for example, like this wearable devices, you know, you can monitor the heart rate and 24 seven and then your body temperature. And um, so for example, if you are walking it can help to monitor your walk, it's like how much you know. Step you took. If you um, if you are, are sleeping, it can help to monitor your sleeping patterns and can help to tell you maybe you know you have not good sleeping patterns and then you may have ending up with a sleep apnea disease. And then it can help to monitor heart rate if somebody have any issue of you know like maybe risk of stroke or some other, then these kind of devices can send the information continuous. Those continuous information, we can able to build some kind of model which can help us to predict some kind of cases. For example, I give you one example is if one person is old and after office, maybe, maybe 58 years old after office is walking back to home and in the night there's nobody around him, but he's wearing this wearable um, device and maybe he was a patient of stroke and he suddenly just fell down uh, at the risk. The watch can able to alarm and maybe can able to connect to their nearby emergency services and also can send the location by GPS automatically and also can have emergency call to their family member. And then the emergency uh, rescue team can able to monitor um, based on the location and go and save the person and provide the basic care and at the same time. So this is uh, one of the example which was shared already in US as well, where they mentioned about the Apple Watch help the one person to save their life uh, like this way. So these are the small, small things. But nowadays people are focusing on the home care, like how you can monitor this more because they don't want to go to the hospital all the time. So this information, everyday information, um, everyday monitoring heart rate continuously, your body temperature, your other vitals, uh, all this information. If we think that this information can collect for one to two years, we can able to predict some models and we can able to see that how healthy you are or what kind of things you needed to change your lifestyle to become more healthy and stuff. So for example, if there's a diabetic patient, the diabetic patient, if this is just a diabetic only taking the metformin tablet um, drug, but if this person is not taking care much, then they ultimately will move to insulin. However, if that diabetic patient is taking care, doing proper exercise and stuff, 
even though maybe he will f- be fine and he don't need to even take the metformin drug and he can stay on that particular level because he's doing proper exercise and maintaining himself and stuff like that too, right? So this is a way we are trying to see that how we can empower and precise and using this interface methods and more wearable devices and more this big data, which can help them to uh, change their life. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Prof. Osman. Uh, now, Bu, Dr. Chris Warani is online. Maybe you can directly give the question to Prof. Osman. Please, Bu, please. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Bu, okay. is okay. online. Okay, you can give yes. the question okay. directly. I have so many, many questions because I'm very interesting to your uh, speech, to your uh, the topics, and I still have a question, Dr. Usman. Yes. What are the requirements to develop and maintain big data and make sure the data will use to support health policy and health management decision making? What are the requirements to develop and maintain big data? Uh, great. So um, it can start from the very basic level let's say from the mobile phones. Mm -hmm. If there's any app uh, which can monitor the information, you can have that all the information in one server or one database, uh, which can be in one place. So, or it can start from one small hospital. So if if the university has any affiliated hospital, you can start from there, like the patients who are coming, that all the information is stored in one place. So from there, it can be started or it can be started from the small clinic where patients are coming for maybe any antenatal care or maybe they are coming for vaccination of child or something. So it can start from very small scale. It means to focus mm-hmm. on one thing first. And when you can start collecting the information, it has to be accurate. So how you can standardize information is you have to uh, train the people and tell them this is important information and you have to make sure when you're collecting the information that these are things important when you're putting the information into that. And that information can be nowadays there are clouds as well, but they can save in the server too. And then that information you can able to use for different research purposes. For example, if there is one small community and there's a small clinic and the people are going there for um, counseling, education, or for uh, let's say antenatal care or for child vaccination. So if the mothers, they are not aware about the vaccination and then there is a, some educational program and then mother, mothers start coming for the vaccination and then they are also getting the reminders for vaccination. All the information is in the center And then if you want to check the policy implication that uh, what is the impact of the education on mothers that how much is the vaccination rate improved, then this is one of the good things from the data, the data you will have, right? So same thing happen in other different uh, platforms. So it, it does not need to be like to start from the very big thing. It can be start from the very minor thing. So less from the small intervention, from small clinic, from small hospital, uh, from small intervention. And then after that, it can be scale up small, small, small to the big one. Because if somebody start too big in the beginning, it is always chances to be, you know, having some troubles and issues. And also the resources is one of the main constraints because sometimes we don't have enough money to spend on infrastructure. And even we spend on infrastructure, we don't know how to maintain the infrastructure. So maybe IT systems sometimes fail, computers start hanging, people don't know how to use uh, IT systems. So this is uh, one of the big constraints which many people, many mm-hmm. countries also fail in this as well. Mm-hmm. So yes. that's why we suggest to start from the small scale. Small scale. And um, small scale. yeah, small scale and mm-hmm. start with the one focus thing and then step by mm-hmm. step to, to expand it to the Uh, bigger one levels. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. Uh, you mentioned before that uh, Taiwan, uh, when uh, the country that can build one of the best country that have good administering big data from health services, health insurance, and so on. Uh, how Taiwan can build the system? 
Okay, very good question. Um, because the Taiwan has invested in uh, mm. infrastructure, IT, almost IT. 1995, they have the insurance system. Oh. They, 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 their insurance system need the card. Mm. Everybody needs yes. it. Right? And when they were having this data information, they were collecting, they need the electronic system in the hospitals, right? So yes. when the patient visit, they collect the information in the hospital. But then there was, um, and they also slowly, slowly improved. Like mm. I gave example, before they only had the insurance, but they only had the USB. They did not have the data linkage to each other, right? So every patient yeah. were bringing USB. Then they moved to the smart card. Then the data will move to the smart card. Then they have the server. And now they have a cloud. Means now they don't need server. Now they don't need to worry about if there is any um, server damage, any computer damage, because the data is already in the cloud now. And also, before the data was only with the hospital. So if some patient wants to get their data medical record to see the other country doctor, they have to go to the hospital request for the medical record. But now they can check from the mobile app for my health bank to see what is in their information on that. So they don't have to go to the hospital to request for the data because that's their data. So now they're empowered that. So this is the slowly, slowly step. So because Taiwan has invested on the infrastructure in the beginning, and then they improve with time the infrastructure and improve the security and also train their healthcare professionals. So their doctors, they learn that why, how to disease code because you know if the physician don't know what is the ICD code, then how they will code the, in the system. They cannot use the system and the nurses too. So that's why... It is academic and industry collaboration. So it means if the government or stakeholders are spending and willing to uh, spend on infrastructure, then the academics, they also have to improve their curriculum to see that, oh, they should include some informatic courses, uh, some technology courses to, to teach their physicians, doctors, nurses, that how to use the systems. So then when they go in the field, they can able to use the systems like that. Oh, yeah. very interesting. So, Chris, maybe, Dr. Chris, maybe you can yes, yes. Uh, make a short yes. uh, question because we have the time limit limitation. Okay, you can give okay. the question in. Yes, okay. No, maybe, maybe another question, Papare, Padam Dan Sulfa. Have a question to Dr. Uh, Usman. There is from audience. They have uh, one yes. question from audience. Uh, the, the question is about the policy of assessing the data in Taiwan. What what is the policy to access the data from from the hospital, for example? Okay, mm -hmm. um, it's also a very important question. Uh, as I mentioned, that if you are a researcher working in Taiwan and if you are local, either, mm -hmm. only the local people have access to the data directly. However. Mm -hmm. If you're a foreigner but working in Taiwan as a researcher, you have to collaborate with the locals and then apply for the research uh, permission to access that information. Uh, because the data is mostly in Chinese, so of course the language is one of the barrier too, um, then you need to collaborate definitely. However, you can also apply indiv individually to run the data, but with the IRB as an independent researcher. Yeah. Um, and they can able to allow you to, uh, you know, analyze uh, research, but you need an IRB. So with IRB, you can able to access the information uh, secondary. Okay, so that is good. Uh, to Dr. Chris Vardani, do you have any question? Yes, uh, one question again. Okay, one question, yes. because it is very interesting yes. for us. Yes, <laughs> what about validity and reliability of the big data? And how do we know that the big data survey have good administered by the team and of course have good validity and reliability of the data? Thank you. Um, thank you again, uh, Dr. Chris Wardani. A very nice question because the, <laughs> the quality is very important of the data because we build the model and if we build the model which on the bad data, then the outcome is not good too. 
it's the same like if we are cooking something and if we mm -hmm. use uh, bad uh, ingredients, ingredients. Yes. Uh, and the yes. result will be bad too, right? Yes. So as I mentioned in the beginning, that in Taiwan, the doctors, they mm -hmm. keep in the data by themselves. So they don't have coders. So it means mm -hmm. if the patient come to the clinic, the doctor will key in, in the system, or oh, this person has pneumonia, or this person has fever, or you know this and that by themselves. So they know what code of the disease and what mm -hmm. drugs they are going to prescribe. So because doctors are more wow. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so interesting. Yeah, because doctor is more knowledge because he has the more knowledge compared to I others. Think so. So when they will put information, then it, it will be restored in the system and then it will be uh, sent to the claim. That's, so in other countries, in some countries, they have only coders. The doctor, they don't want to put that yes. information. Yeah, so yeah, same. Order. In Indonesia, they, you have the problem. Like Indonesia, <laughs> yes. I yeah, see. yeah, yeah. Okay. So coders, sometimes we, can, we have a chances of error. So we can say that yeah. there's a quality compromise as well. And the second thing is the hospital also ensure the data quality before sending to the insurance. How? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is they check randomly prescriptions and they see that, oh, if oh. there's disease diagnosis misses and only drugs, mm -hmm. why? Uh, yes, thank you. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Peshwadani. Uh, one question from me. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> How about the private clinic? Do the system is connected to the hospital or the national uh, database? Uh, thank you, Dr. Fraser. Also very interesting question because uh, Taiwan whole population is insured and oh, yes. they have national and, and the universal coverage that so whenever they to, no matter they go to private or public, mm -hmm. they yeah. must because they are already paying to the government insurance, so they only yeah. pay the full payment. So the private mm -hmm. sector also have to be, you know, uh, submit their claim data to the yeah, national. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they must have to follow and to align. And actually it's interesting because a few years back, the small clinics, they don't have the enough money to have the IT infrastructure. So they ask government to give them some support. So the government provided some support to a few clinics and say that, oh, you are encouraged to uh, establish the IT uh, system in your clinics so you can join our, uh, you know, like a e, e structure system. And most of the clinics uh, got that too. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. That is very interesting. Okay. Uh, I see here in chat, there is no more question. I think we already have the answer all. Okay, there is no more question here. Okay, Prof. Usman, I think you already give the answer for the question from the audience and also from you, Dr. Peswarani and also from me. And now, it, uh, what time is it now in Taiwan? Uh, in Taiwan is now 4 p.m. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, advance one hour from here. Yes. Yeah, yeah. See one hour from, from Indonesia, Indonesia. Uh, yes. One hour from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we arrive at the end of this session. Before we close this session, maybe Dr. Chris Wardani yes. will give some speech. Once again, thank you very much, Prof. Usman, from me. Thank and you. then now yes. I will. I will give time to, to, to Dr. Chris Barden, please. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Maret. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Usman Iqbal. Uh, we together have attended a lecture from Doc, Dr. Usman Iqbal from Taiwan Medical University, Taiwan. Uh, as I mentioned before, that visiting case lecturers from abroad is a routine activity that we carry out to provide knowledge and insight about a specific topic, especially current issues, uh, like the role of big data to support health policy. Uh, uh, as you know, Indonesia has a big data survey. 
uh, for example, uh, big data survey about National Social Economic Survey, <coughs> I'm sorry, conducted by Central Bureau of Statistics. And of course, Ministry of Health also conduct a big survey. Uh, we call it basic health survey or like in Taiwan, <coughs> uh, since 1 January uh, 2014, Indonesia implemented national health insurance administer, administered by Social Security Administering Agency. We call it DPGS Kesehatan. And of course, uh, from, the, from the era, we will uh, have the big data uh, and of course we can uh, use the data, uh, especially uh, people from Indonesia, I think like in Taiwan, yes. And BPGS Kesehatan uh, have many, many data from health facility, of course, uh, from participants, claim, and so on. Yes. Uh, Okay, uh, for the lecture you gave us, we thank you very much, Dr. Iqbal, Dr. Usman Iqbal. And uh, as a thank you, we gave you a, a, a guest lecturer speaker certificate. Uh, I will, this is the, sorry. So the certificate is in principle. Yes, <laughs> this is a certificate. <laughs> I will, I will send the file to your email. I will give you the certificate. Thank you very much. And of course, we also thanks to our dean, you know, all of the participants. Some of the participants are our lecturer. And of course, uh, Pak Farid, thank you very much. Yes. And Mbak, Mbak, siapa? Mbak Dian, Mbak Dina. Dina. Mbak Dina. Yeah, yes, Mbak Dina, Mbak Dina. thank our... you very much. Also, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Usman Iqbal. Uh, see you next time. And of course, may Allah bless you. And thank you very much. Wassalam. Okay, thank you very much to Dr. Chris Wadani. Now we will close this event. Prof. Usman Iqbal, thank you very much for your presentation. All the participants and also... We have Mbak Dina here. Mbak Dina is also alumni from our yes, master degree. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you. Thank you. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you next time, Dr. See you next time. Yes. So I will close the Zoom meeting. Yes, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs>